night we introduced suffering, how in the material world there's a lot of suffering and people who are engaged in Krishna consciousness, who have taken shelter of devotional service, they also undergo some suffering. But their suffering is a little different from the suffering of the ordinary people because a devotee has surrendered himself to Lord Krishna. So why does a devotee undergo suffering? So we explained last night that it's to take away that little bit of desire to enjoy them in the material world. The sufferings which we undergo are meant for our purification to help us to give up that enjoying mentality and it's a special reciprocation from Lord Krishna with his devotee to help the devotee give up that desire for enjoyment in material life. So the difficulties, the sufferings which a devotee undergoes, it's not karma but it's a special arrangement of Lord Krishna to increase our devotion, to help us to advance more in the mood of devotion. All right, so you remember uh, we, we quoted the one verse, let me find it, yes yeah, this verse, this, we quoted this verse to you famous verse from the Srimad Bhagavatam, prayer offered by Lord Brahma and he's talking about those people who patiently suffer the reactions of their past misdeeds and continue offering their respectful obeisances with their heart, words and body. So they, they go on uh, with their devotion despite the difficulties, the, despite all the obstacles which they're undergoing, they continue with their devotion and in this way they become eligible for liberation. So that, that verse is often quoted, it's a good verse to know. So we sh the idea is we should wait for the mercy from Lord Krishna to be stood upon us. All right, here's a quotation now uh, from Srila Prabhupada. Oh, I'm sorry, the fonts and some of the Sanskrit words are off. You'll have to forgive me for that. Uh, let's see. Oh. So a quotation from a, a Back to Godhead article, it, it is stopped at once. The example of switching off an electric fan is quite suitable here. The running fan has been switched off but it runs also for a few more seconds by dint of the original So we want to point out that there are three causes of suffering. We want to look at the cause of the suffering. Where does it come about? How does it come about? So Rupa Goswami identifies three different causes of suffering. And the root cause of all suffering is avidya. Avidya meaning ignorance. Right? Avidya. We say, Master M.A. 
Master of Avidya. People like to get their MA degree, their master's degree, become masters of Avidya. So Avidya meaning ignorance. And this is the root cause of all suffering. And from Avidya, the next stage comes Bij, Bija. Again, the fonts are wrong here, but it should be Bija. Bij meaning the seed or material desires, desires for sinful activities. And that leads to actual sinful actions, which are pa, sinful activities. And sinful activities cause suffering. So you can see the chain between the different stages, the causes of suffering. The initial cause, ignorance. What is that ignorance? Ignorance of our spiritual identity and our eternal relationship with the Supreme Lord. That is the ignorance which we are placed in. And because of that ignorance, we allow material desires to develop in our mind. And these material desires cause us to act sinfully. And then when we act sinfully, we suffer. So you can see the chain of action and reaction. We point out there are two kinds of sinful reactions. The reactions which come upon us from our sins are of two types. Uh, one is called aparabdha, which means unmanifested, or you could say immature. It's, it's not yet visible. Aparabdha, unmanifested. Just like someone may have committed a crime. And because they've committed a crime, the police may be looking for him. So the man is conscious that the police are looking for him. And he's constantly hiding and worrying, when are the police going to come to try to capture me? So like that, this kind of suffering, it's not yet manifested, but it's going to come soon. The, soon the police will come and the man will be arrested and taken and put into custody. So in the same way, <coughs> we have sinful, sinful reactions. We've done sinful things. And we're not yet suffering for them, but in the future, the reactions will come on us. It's just a question of time. The reactions are not yet mature, but they will become mature. And then the other type of reaction is called prarabdha. There's aparabdha and parabdha. So you can guess the meaning. Parabdha means sinful reactions which are mature or manifested. These sinful reactions are visible in the form of someone may have chronic disease. It's a sinful, it's a reaction for their sin. Someone may have a poor education, that may also be a reaction due to sinful activities. Not everyone is blessed with the opportunity to get a good education. Another type of sinful reaction which may be manifest comes in the form of the the physical body being attractive and not being attractive. That is again 
the reactions which come due to our activities. The person who has acted sinful, then they may be placed in the body which is not so attractive. In this way the sinful reactions are in two different stages. One is unmanifested and the other is manifested. Srila Prabhupada explains to us, sinful activities are of two kinds, those that are mature and those which are not mature. The sinful activities for which we are suffering at the present moment are called mature. The many sinful activities stored within us for which we have not yet suffered are considered immature. Now, Hearing that there are reactions, parabda meaning, parabda meaning manifested reactions. We would like to destroy these reactions. We would like to remove them. And the Srimad Bhagavatam describes, it gives evidence how these reactions can be removed. This important verse is given from the third canto. Those of you who have studied Bhakti Vai Baba will know this verse very well. It's one of the memorization verses which the devotees learn. It's a verse spoken by Mother Devahuti to Lord Kapila and she's describing to him how even a person born in a family of dog eaters immediately becomes eligible to perform Vedic sacrifices if he once utters the holy name of the Supreme Personality of Godhead or chants about him, hears about his pastimes, offers him obeisances or even remembers him. So this is a very powerful statement in the Srimad Bhagavatam describing the power of devotional service. That it says just by uttering the holy name even once you can perform a Vedic sacrifice. Now, of course, the tradition is that to perform a Vedic sacrifice, you should be a Brahmana. You should be born in a Brahmana family and you should have all the some scars of a Brahmana. There are ten some scars. And in order to properly perform a Vedic sacrifice, Somebody should have performed the ten samskars and also studied the Vedas. Then they're qualified to perform a Vedic sacrifice. But here, Devahuti say, is saying to Lord Kapila that even if you're born in a family of dog eaters, now, if you're born in the family of dog eaters, it's considered that in your past you must have been sinful because it's considered a low birth to be in a family who eat dog's meat. It is not… Of course, someone, someone said to Prabhupada one time, you know, Prabhupada was talking about preaching, going to countries where pe people eat dogs and, you know, they said, he said to Prabhupada, Prabhupada, if I go there, everybody eats dog meat there. But Prabhupada didn't think, oh, no, you shouldn't go. Prabhupada said, well, you Americans, you eat cows. You're more sinful. 
It's unimaginable that people would eat cow's meat because the cow is the most sacred of all animals. Anyway, dog eaters, people, you know, low-born sinful people will eat dogs. And it, you, we, we would see that sometimes. You would see people, they keep dogs and then they'll kill them and they'll cook them. And I know one country I was preaching for some time in the Philippines. So in the Philippines, there's some people, they eat dogs meat there. And people, people told me, they said, the one reason why they eat dogs meat is because it puts a lot of heat in the body. So when they eat dog's meat, then the body will become very hot and then they'll drink more cold beer. You see? So this was, this was the logic behind eating dog's meat, that you will enjoy drinking beer more. So this, this, this is the logic. One sinful activity leads to another sinful activity. Anyway, the, the point is made here that simply by engaging in devotional activities, and we are given some examples, uttering the holy name even one time, or chants about him, or even just hears about him, or offers his obeisances, or remembers him, then you become qualified to perform a Vedic sacrifice. So this is, and, and it mentions, it, it doesn't say that, oh, you have to take some time before you become qualified. It said you immediately become qualified to perform the Vedic sacrifice. So this is the potency of devotional service. Of course, we have to understand there is quality in our activities. Just like chanting the holy name, there is quality in the chanting. It's not just anyone and everyone becomes qualified. But when you do it, with proper, with the proper mood, then you become qualified. Even though you may be born in the dog-eater family, you become elevated that you can perform a Vedic sacrifice. So this, this example is given to show us that sinful, sinful reactions are manifest when someone's born in a family of dog eaters. But that reaction can be removed by devotional service, just by doing things like chanting the holy name. So this way, parabda reactions can be destroyed, right? We'll go on and see, what about aparabda? Destroying aparabdha reactions. Aparabdha means they're there in the subtle form, they're not yet manifest. So we quote this verse from the Srimad Bhagavatam from the 11th canto. Lord Krishna is speaking to Uddhava. It's the Uddhava Gita. He's saying, My dear Uddhava, Devotional service unto me is just like a blazing fire which can burn into ashes, unlimited fuel supplied to it. This is the power of devotional service. However, look how devotional service is described. That it said, it is just like a blazing fire. So you're going to do devotional service, it's got to be like a blazing fire to have that effect, right? It's got to be done with that potency, then you'll get the benefit. 
and it will burn to ashes all the reactions which are there, the sinful reactions which are there in the subtle form in our consciousness. Okay? Oh, I'm sorry, what happened? So describing sinful reactions, persons who are completely engaged in the devotional service of Lord Vishnu, the personality of Godhead, becomes completely extinct from all sorts of vicious reactions, which either potential, germinating, seedling or current by a gradual process. So this is describing the different stages of sinful reactions. They come in different stages, four main stages. The, vice, the vices in their different stages of development are analyzed herein. Fallen Mukam vice is that which we may be undergoing at the present stage of life. So Falun Mukha, we're undergoing, it means that it, it, it's already manifest, it's already parabdha karma, it's visible, it's mature. But then there's another stage which is called Bij, Bijavais is the seedling stage by our desire of different types. And then there's another stage which is called Kuta, which is prior to the stage of Bija, that is in the germinating stage. So Kuta is the beginning, it's, you, you have a proclivity towards sinful activity, you have an interest, you haven't really got the desire to do anything but you're taking an interest in sinful activities. And then bija, when we actually start to think about doing sinful activities, then the seed is there. So puta, then bija, and then it becomes parabdha or aparabdha first. Aparabdha is the fountain source of all. And from this storehouse, of vicious life, all other stages develop. And all these stages of vicious life become at once switched off by adoption of devotional service. So this is the power of devotional service, that it takes away all of the different stages of reactions due to sinful activity. Only devotional service can do that. As I explained yesterday, sometimes people do things like put the fish back in the sea or let the birds go free. They're trying to get some pious activity and to destroy some of their sins. They want some good karma, but they don't change the desire. The desire for sinful activities will remain, and that is the problem. Srila Prabhupada writes, It appears that the process of extinction goes under gradual process, but actually it is stopped at once. The example of switching off an electric fan is quite suitable here. The running fan, after being switched off, runs also for a few seconds by dint of the original force, but actually the power of movement is already stopped. The power is turned off, but still some momentum is there. So sinful reactions are like that, that we may have stopped sinful activities, 
but still some karma is there from the past, some reactions are there from the past, different stages. They're there in the subtle form, right? We said there's parabda and aparabda. So you can see here on the top, sinful action. And then aparabda one, the unmanifested reaction. And then that leads to parabda. In the beginning it's unmanifest, but after some time it will become mature and will be visible. You get the reactions. It may be physical or it may be emotional suffering. We suffer emotionally. We know women are, can be very emotional. These are the reactions sometimes which come on them. And on the other side we have aparabdha, again aparabdha too. And the other form it may come in, it will come is it will come indirect suffering, increased sinful proclivity. It means more interest in sinful activity, stronger in your desire towards sinful activities is increasing. That is the the unmanifested reactions coming upon us. Right. Here you can see in this picture here the relationship between the different stages. You can see the relationship between the different stages. On the top we have ignorance. Right? And then that's giving sinful desire. And then from sinful desire comes sinful action. And the sinful action causes reactions. And the reaction may come and may first of all be unmanifest. But after the unmanifest stage, then it becomes manifest. And that is the cause of suffering. The unmanifest stage is you're not suffering very much, but when it becomes manifest, then your suffering is there. And on the other hand, the unmanifested reaction, it may simply go to more, more inclination towards sinful activities and goes up to kutam, sinful disposition. You become more attracted, more interested in sinful activities. You're thinking more about it and that's causing more sinful desires, leads to sinful actions, suffering. You can see the, the circle, the connection between the different stages of desire towards sinful activities. So, in the nectar of devotion, Srila Prabhupada gives two examples describing about how uh, other processes fail to give us freedom from material desire. He describes two situations in the text. The two examples are important. One example is about the bathing of an elephant. The elephant likes to take a bath. And if you ever saw those elephants, they have some in our temple in Mayapur, 
or in South India, their temples, they keep nice more elephants there. So the elephants are interesting creatures. They like to have a bath, but their custom is after taking the bath, then they will come out and they will throw dirt over their bodies again. So people are often like that, that they will do something to make up for a talk to try to atone for their sinful activities, but then they go on and do more sins. Many people would come to bathe in the Ganga to leave their sinful reactions. And they don't stop sinful activities, but after bathing in the Ganga, then they go on and do more sinful activities. So they don't stop. So this is it. The, the failure to, they, they fail to get rid of their material desires. Another example which Srila Prabhupada gives was about people who get some sexual disease, just like there were disease like uh, AIDS. People get these sexually transmitted diseases and they may suffer very painful treatment and be very embarrassed also by having the disease. But still, if they get cured from the disease, they still have the desire. They don't give up the desire for sex. So that's another example that although people suffer the material desires still remain with them and they continue to engage in their sinful activities. From the Srimad Bhagavatam, Prabhupada writes, the bhaktas by their transcendental devotional service unto the lotus feet of the Lord, become so overwhelmed with transcendental bliss that automatically their desire for material enjoyment stop. Desires for fruitive activities are strongly rooted, but the trees of desire can be uprooted completely by devotional service because devotional service employs superior desire. So superior desire, that is the devotee in Krishna consciousness. The material desires, that is the lower desire. Just like in Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna describes Param Dristva. There's the lower taste and there's the higher taste. So one who is engaged in devotional service, he loses the desire for the lower things. The happiness, the pleasure of the, the pigs which eat stool and the dogs, their pleasure, that is not for the devotee. The devotees want the higher taste, the higher pleasure. Another quotation, Sanat Kumar says, My dear king, the false ego of a human being is so strong that it keeps him in material existence as if tied up by a strong rope. Only the devotees can cut off the knot of this strong rope very easily by engaging themselves in Krishna consciousness. Others who are not in Krishna consciousness but are trying become great mistakes or great ritual performers, cannot advance like the devotees. Therefore, it is the duty of everyone to engage himself in the activities of Krishna consciousness in order to be freed from the tight knot of false ego and engagement 
in material activities. So the false ego, again, ignorance, avidya, the cause of suffering is this ignorance or avidya. We want to understand how to remove this. This tight knot of false ego is due to ignorance. As long as one is ignorant about his identity, he is sure to act wrongly and thereby become entangled in material contamination. So only devotional service can help us to remove that false ego, that knot of ignorance. Another example is given. There are many, many snakes on the ground of the forest and when a fire takes place, it burns the dry foliage and the snakes are immediately attacked. Similarly, the blazing fire of Krishna consciousness is so strong that the snakes of ignorance are immediately killed. So this example is given, snakes, the snakes are compared to ignorance and the snakes are killed by the blazing fire, the snakes are burned in the fire the same way the ignorance is removed by Krishna consciousness. Krishna consciousness is compared to the fire, right? So the best means of obtaining relief from distress. Right? We're overviewing the main points. First of all, sinful reactions in different stages, parabdha and aparabdha, and how to remove them, how they can be removed. Remember, parabdha karma can be removed by, how would we remove them? Parabdha karma reactions can be removed by, huh? By chanting the holy name or hearing or remembering. This, an aparabdha karma can be removed by devotional service which is like a blazing fire. Right? And then four stages of sin, four stages, the four stages being putta, bija, parabdha and aparabdha material desires described. The example is given about Ajamila. Ajamila as a young man was a brahmana but somehow he became deviated and he gave up his chaste wife and went off with an unchaste woman and became very sinful but somehow he was blessed to have a child and he gave the good name. And then the examples, we give the example venereal disease, we spoke about the sexual disease and the other example, the elephant bathing. These two examples are there to show that material activities fail to take away desires. We need to engage in devotional service. It is only devotional service which will take away our desire for sinful activities. And then avidya, ignorance described in the fourth canto, the analogy, the snakes of ignorance, how they're killed in the blazing fire. So these were the main points what we covered here this evening. The best means of obtaining relief from distress. Devotional service, therefore, has the power to actually nullify 
all kinds of reactions to sinful deeds. All kinds of reactions, no matter how sinful you've been, it can be removed by devotional service. This sinful desire seed can be removed only by achieving Krishna consciousness. So we have to understand it's not just any kind of activity, but you have to actually come to that platform of real devotion, pure devotion, not just the desire for material enjoyment and a little bit Krishna consciousness. There has to be that commitment to the service of Krishna. Krishna consciousness is so strong that the snakes of ignorance are immediately killed. It is the only process that can counteract all three causes. The causes of suffering, what were the causes? First of all, the root cause, ignorance, and then cause of suffering, sinful desires, and then sinful activities. So these are the problems. We have to counteract these things and we can do it by devotional service. So we've given a, a brief overview of the, the characteristics of pure devotion and at what stages they manifest. Actually, we didn't cover that. The, what else did we, we talk about? We spoke about klesh agni, the removal of sinful reactions. It is the first benefit of sadhana bhakti. You get immediate relief from all kinds of distress. So klesh agni, klesh agni. Klesha is a distress and agni is to remove that. We remove the distress from the heart, from the mind, from the body, all the suffering which we undergo. It can all be removed by devotional service. And we then we spoke about the four kinds of effects of sin and how devotional service has the power to nullify all kinds of sinful reactions. And we gave different analogies, right? Material desires, cause of suffering, how to, what was the example? Snakes. Just like the snakes are burned in the forest fire. So material desires are like poison snakes. And the material desires can be removed by the fire of devotional service. Parabdha karma can be removed by chanting the holy name, remembering the Lord, offering obeisances to Him. And then aparabdha karma, the unmanifest stages of sinful reactions, because we're carrying the reactions from many lifetimes, not just only this life, but from many lives, we have the sinful reactions, we have sinful reactions from family, from community, different con the countries which we're born in also. We take part of the karma because you're enjoying the benefits of the country. So you get also karma from the country. And then karma, sinful karma, causing reaction, bringing you suffering. So all of these things can be removed by devotional service. 
why devotional service is the best means to obtain relief from distress? It's the best means because it's the only means which takes away the desire for sinful activities. All other processes, they may give temporary relief, but devotional service is so complete and so thorough it will take away even the desire for sinful activities. No other process can do that. So that is why devotional service is the best means to get relief from distress. We want to get relief from distress so it never comes back, it doesn't come back. So if we remain in Krishna consciousness, then we will get free of all the seeds of karma, the reactions which are coming upon us. All right, we just have a final quote from Srila Prabhupada. Prabhupada said, material contamination is very subtle. It's beginning, it's fruition and results and how one suffers such results in the form of distress are part of a great chain. When one catches some disease, it is often very difficult to ascertain the cause of the disease. The practical injection to stop all the fructification of the seeds of our sinful activities is simply engagement in Krishna consciousness. Right? Prabhupada's quote here from the nectar of devotion. All right? So, very nice quote here, Prabhupada describing material contamination, how it's so subtle. We are often not aware of how contaminated we are, how we have karma from so many different places, different activities, and it's in all different stages. We have to be very careful to keep ourselves strong in Krishna consciousness, and that will protect us. Okay, are there any questions? Yes, Prabhu. Krishna Maharaj. Maharaj, um, Abhidhya gave the rule of all the process of misery. Um, so, but when we come to Krishna consciousness, we hear when we, we, we understand the reasons for many things. Abhidhya is, I mean, in Krishna consciousness, we have been clear about the Abhidhya. But at the same time, we still sometimes have the probability, we still have the sinful desires. Uh, why does it take longer to clear that when ignorance is already removed? For example, we know we should not do something, but the desire is to do that. Well, it depends on our own application of devotional service. It will depend on the intensity of our efforts to please Krishna and to take full shelter of, the, of Krishna through the actions of devotional service. If we're maintaining attachments to the material energy, then it will be difficult because we hold on to the material world. We don't let go, we're holding on to the material things and then we're wondering why we're getting reactions because we, have, we haven't fully committed, we haven't fully taken shelter of Lord Krishna. We're holding on to the material thoughts, material plans. That desire to enjoy is there. We want to enjoy. And of course, it's not wrong to want to enjoy, but we have to know where and how to enjoy. 
and the real enjoyment is there in service. The real pleasure comes in being the servant of Krishna. But we're still trying to be the master. We want to, in, we want to enjoy. We make plans for our own pleasure. So because we don't fully commit ourselves to Lord Krishna's program, we, as Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, as you surrender, I reward you accordingly. All men follow my path in all respects. So everything depends on our own commitment to the service of Krishna. We get the reactions as we deserve. And sometimes, as we heard yesterday, sometimes Krishna will give special mercy just to help us to let go of the material world. It's a little painful for us sometimes to hear these things, but this is this that pain. Just like sometimes when you put an ointment, you may have like, maybe you have a cut or an infection and you put an ointment on it and when you put the ointment you feel it's stinging, but that stinging is going to cure the disease, it's going to help you cure that infection. So the difficulties which we undergo in Krishna consciousness are for our benefit. Therefore, to help us to come closer and to commit ourselves more fully to Lord Krishna. So they're actually the blessing of Lord Krishna. The difficulties which we undergo are blessings. Yes? <laughs> In the in Bhakti Riksha, you see some, some new devotees, if something nice happens, they get motivated, they become devotees. Sometimes some devotees, something bad happens, they do become devotees, they just drop out. Drop out. So, it, uh, suppose they become more devotional, but they just drop out and move into a How I understand that? Well, we could say they're not very serious. <laughs> they drop out. They, they don't continue with Krishna consciousness, they should, they should think they're very fortunate when something bad happens. You should, they should think, oh, this is Krishna's mercy, this is something very special, that Krishna's giving me difficulties. So they should help to increase their eagerness for Krishna consciousness. But they have weak faith, you know, they drop out. Their faith is not very strong. They need to hear more. They need to take more instruction from the senior Vaishnavas and understand and appreciate that the difficulties which come are a blessing and they're a, a, an impetus. They help us to surrender more to Krishna. Right? So we have, we have to preach to them like that and help them to understand. Of course, even some people, even some people, nothing bad happens to them, but still they don't continue, they also go away, you know. It's not only the people who bad things happen to, even the people who nothing happens to them, still they don't come, they stop coming. We cannot understand the minds of everyone. They have their own reasons, they're not yet ready to commit themselves to Krishna consciousness. They need more time. Hmm? Yes? Any other question? But 
，感觉不到 Krishna。我想请问一下，是不是只有呃来听靠 Krishna 的仁慈，呃，当 Krishna 展现在我眼前或者心中的时候，我才能够始终处于 Krishna 之源之中？那可是。哈哈哈哈哈哈！嗯，嗯，他他看不到 Krishna。Okay, when I I know I have a Krishna consciousness is so important, but suddenly I didn't I didn't I can feel where's Krishna? How can that Krishna uh is my heart? I can feel Krishna in my heart and I can see Krishna in form of me. So I didn't get any feel. So how can I understand? I have a Krishna consciousness. Well, you have to chant. By chanting, you can get Krishna consciousness. Do more kirtan. Take part in the kirtan. Chant the holy name, and you will have more Krishna consciousness. Krishna is here in the temple. Every day you see Krishna. You're not seeing him. Every day there's the sun. You get the light of the sun. That is Krishna. Every day you drink water. The taste of water. That is Krishna. Krishna's everywhere, in everyone, in everyone's heart. Krishna is there. You have to. You have to see. Krishna. Oh, you want to see him play the flute? Yeah? Okay. Well, we want to see him as a cowherd boy. That, that is for the, the special devotees. You have to be qualified as a, to go into Vrindavan. You have to become one of the people of Vrindavan, then you will see Krishna play the flute. Right? Are you ready to become a cowherd girl? Are you ready to pick up the cow dung? Yes. We'll send you to Lanchang. We have, we have many cows. They're going tomorrow. Oh, really? Okay, so you can practice serving the cows. Very good. Mm -hmm. uh, Mama, the whole is coming. So it, it's a very good opportunity to take away sinful reactions. So, Umar, should we offer ghee sticks or ghee lamps or tulsi with cotton buds and which would, which would be the better option? Well, the main thing is to offer the light, whether it's cotton buds or whatever you're offering. The main, it can be a candle also. The main thing is we offer the light. It's the light. The light is the symbol of knowledge and it overcomes the ignorance of the darkness of ignorance. So it doesn't matter whether it's a cotton bud or a givek or whatever you're offering. The important thing should be the light, the lamp. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Please accept the humble obeisances of Lord Jesus Christ. Guru Ranch, if one performs devotional service uh, without placing emphasis in hearing and chanting, how much can that devotional service uh, help in removing sins or even helping the individual advance?
How much can devotional self-service help to overcome sinful reactions? Yeah, if they don't place emphasis in hearing and chanting, and they perform all other types of devotion, one will not all the types of devotion. Well, it's mentioned in Srimad Bhagavatam that if one doesn't have a taste for hearing and chanting, then they can simply engage in service. By serving the devotees who are free of sin, great service is done. And by such service one gains affinity for hearing the message of Bhagavatam. So if someone's engaged in serving the devotees, very good. Mahatsevam dwarama hurti muktes. It opens the doors to liberation. Right? So, devotional service is, it, 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 it's, it can be very general. It's not that you have to do. Certainly, hearing and chanting is very important, but serving the Vaishnavas is also very, very powerful. And if somebody does a lot of service for the Vaishnavas, then certainly they'll get a lot of mercy, they'll get a lot of blessing and they'll get a taste for hearing more about Lord Krishna. So it's not just only hearing and chanting, yeah? any service, as we heard from that verse it said, remembering the Lord, uh, offering obeisances to the Lord, all these different activities were all mentioned. They all have the power to give one qualification to perform the Vedic Yajna. But generally we, we encourage hearing and chanting because they are the root, this, the, the root of the Bhakti Kripa. But service to the Vaishnavas also very, very powerful. Okay, any other question? Okay, thank you very much. Hare Krishna.